Today's video will be looking at the 486DX4, the last of the great Intel 486s. We got 20 minute videos on old technology, computers, laser discs, and some CDs. We got two little dogs licking their balls on the screen. And now it's time for the show. Okay, so you're probably wondering, what is this? Why is this covered up like it's some kind of premier, super fancy presentation? Well, it's fancy for this YouTube show anyways. A um, little bit of showmanship, I guess. Um, okay, this thing is really cool. Uh, and I randomly picked it up at a swap meet. And um, I, I wanted to do, like, I don't even have the room for this thing, but I'm going to keep it. And... Uh, I, I want to do a video on it, and uh, if you've already seen the title and the intro, uh, this is primarily about, you know, the Intel uh, DX4 486, the last 486 from Intel at 100 megahertz. Um, and, but really it's about this specific PC, and that CPU is the heart of this uh, machine. So I'm going to unveil this beast uh, right now, and... Um yeah, that, that, that is a tower. Um, yeah, I randomly picked this thing up uh, at a swap meet for a really good price. And um, it just kept surprising me. I, now, I've been in this thing. I know what's in there. Uh, it powers up. It, it boots. It posts. Uh, and it, it just kept surprising. There's, there's some cool stuff inside there uh, that I don't have and I've never really seen before. I know what it is, but... Um, I just didn't have any examples of it. Um, this thing is awesome. This this case is uh, is amazing. And we're going to go over it, and then we're going to talk about the heart of this uh, machine here, which is a Intel uh, 46 DX4 to 100 megahertz. And um, what I'm going to do with this video is I'm just going to restore this thing as best as I can. Now, from what I can tell, it looks just like this thing was put together in the mid 90s. And then it wasn't touched. It wasn't really upgraded um, after that time. Well, there's, there's not a ton you could have done with it anyways. But this would have been a really high end for that time period. And I'm just going to, I'm not really going to swap things out. We're just going to go over everything in this thing. And we're just going to get it up and running again and see how it performs with what is in this thing uh, when I purchase it. Now, I might do some tweaking. Uh, of course, I'm going to probably put something here, probably a five and a quarter inch drive here, clean it up. Uh, like I said, maybe do some tweaks and stuff, but we're just gonna kind of restore this thing uh, to how w with what it already has in it. So I'm pretty excited for this video and this journey, and uh, I hope you're excited to to come with me on this journey on restoring this awesome uh, 46 DX4 tower. All right, so we're just gonna start from the top and go down, and I'm just gonna show you this thing and talk about it. And then we're going to open it up and we're going to look inside at all the cool stuff. And then we're going to start with, you know, kind of restoring it, cleaning it up and uh, seeing if I can get it. Now, I, I, it posts, but um, it doesn't boot. To, I don't even think there's a hard drive hooked up. Uh, I haven't really had time to look into this thing too deeply, but there's some cool stuff in there. So let's, uh, let's start. I mean, it is a tall. This is like a full tower. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six uh six five and a half inch or five and a quarter inch slots um no three and a half inch slots but you can have adapters it's this is still big i think i don't think this is quite as big as the tower i used to have that i gave away to a friend but it's it's close and in my opinion it it looks better it's a little more manageable and it just it has a little more style to it and uh we're gonna go over that so let's let's start at the top here uh we have a Three and a half inch, 1.44 megabyte floppy drive. I don't even know if this thing works, uh, but it's in a little adapter uh, for the, the larger bay. Uh, underneath it, we have nothing. This is missing. This wasn't there when I picked it up. Uh, I think I'm going to put in a uh, five and a quarter inch, you know, 1.2 megabyte floppy drive there. Then under that, we have a 120 megabyte. Um, is that a tape drive? Uh, so. This would be 
kind of like kind of like zip disks if you don't know what this is they take like data tapes I'm not familiar with these I've never used them I've seen them I've owned them but I've never played around with them uh, but 120 megabytes isn't that the same as a zip drive or zip drives are 100 megabytes um, and then there's bigger ones too but yeah this is this is a little bit different I think these are almost like cassette tapes that this thing uses never messed around with this before but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it in there probably okay so moving down a little bit more we have a CD-ROM drive from Creative um, this is the MPC2 multimedia PC uh, I don't know the speed of this drive it is older and I believe it is a caddy drive uh, let me see I, I have one okay so I have one of those here instead of just a, like a tray drive where a tray comes out and you put the CD in it and it goes in uh, earlier drives used the caddy method so you'd have something like this and uh, it opens I haven't played with these too much anyways this thing opens you put your CD in there you, uh, you load it into this and then it goes in and it plays your CD. It's, I mean, it's not horribly different, but it's just a little bit different method for inserting the uh, CD in there. I guess this was supposed to kind of like protect the CD, and then you put it in there, and then that slides, and then it spins, and it gets it gets red. Uh, so, but that's kind of cool. I mean, there's really no advantage to these things, but it's just an older way of doing it, and it, it makes more sense for this setup, and it's just it's cool. I hope it works. Again, I haven't tested any of these drives. Um, now below that is what looks like two hard drives. Um, I think these are hard drives. Uh, I can see LEDs here and here. I don't know any, I don't know if these work. I don't think they're connected. Um, this one's a little bent, like pushed in. I'm gonna have to fix that. Um, but yeah, it looks like we've got uh, two hard drives two hard drives there then I do not know if those are functioning um, I know it didn't I don't think I remember hearing them spin up or anything when I powered this thing up I only powered it up once um, so I don't even remember if those are hooked up so going down a little bit more in this cool case um, we have an LED display megahertz uh, I wish this was a three digit because the CPU in there is a hundred megahertz uh, but some of those, I think the, the 100 megahertz uh, DX4s actually run at 99 megahertz because it's 33 times 3. And so it's really 99, but they kind of round up to 100. So it, it, it doesn't bother me too bad that we can maybe put 99 there running a DX4 at 100 megahertz. So that, that's okay. Uh, power, turbo, and the hard drive activity LEDs right there. Label display. We have our reset button. We've got our turbo button, and then we've got our power button, and I don't ever really recall seeing a power button quite like this on this case. Um, it's just a big green, like, switch, and I believe it lights up green when it has power. Um, that's just really cool. It almost looks like something that someone, like, custom put in there, but I, I don't know. It's, I've never had a case with a button or switch quite like that and it's it's really cool and then we just keep going down here's the the badges for something called uh, Veron? Verexon? V-E-R-X-I-O-N uh, I haven't looked that name up maybe there was some kind of local PC um, you know I don't say make, maker but they would put together machines and sell them. I know there's a ton of companies like that back in the day, kind of like Dell and Gateway, but smaller scale that uh, did things like that. So maybe that was just a local company back in the mid early 90s. Um, you have your lock here, and then just a cool stylish case as we go down. And then it even has a little kind of base, like a foot base here. And you can, there's screws on it. You can unscrew this and take this little base thing off if you'd like. Uh, but I like it. It kind of helps it with uh, stability. So, yeah, it's, that's, this thing's really, really cool. So I'm looking forward to poking around in there and restoring it as best as we can. Okay, so I did want to just flip it around so we could just look at the back, get a general overview really quick. So here's the back of the case. Don't have all the screws in, obviously. 
We've got our power supply here at the top. Um, this is where you put, and there's a lot more than usual here, this is where you put in your little connectors for like your serial and your parallel. And um, right now we just have one for, I think this is a serial uh, connector, and everything else is just open. Uh, down a little bit more, we have our AT connector, that's pretty standard. And then we just have our one, two, three, let's see those are normal like kind of expansion slots in there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, expansion slots, pretty standard. And um, you can already tell this is going to be a network card. I don't really mess with network stuff, but I might just leave it in there. Um, this looks like an I.O. card. I think it is. I know it's, that is. We've got our video. Uh, I think that's SCSI. And we got our sound card. But there's some really cool kind of high-end cards uh, that were in this machine when I picked it up. And we're going to take a look at those next. And... Uh, it's just, it's just cool. <laughs> I'm really digging this tower, this, this Super 46 tower. All right, so here it is with the case cover off. Now, this is only the second time I've looked in this machine, so um, I don't remember a lot of this stuff. Uh, like I said, I did look in here and I took out the cards and I looked at them, uh, but I haven't really gone over this thing thoroughly. So again, this is only the second time I've been in this machine. Um, first thing you notice, weird placement for a speaker, <laughs> kind of like there. Um, uh, we've got some bays here. Now I did notice those hard drives, uh, they would be there, they're not there. So it looks like these are just like um, trays and you'd put a hard drive on them and you'd, I guess you'd hook up, there's probably a pin for the light, um, that LED light on the front and um, you'd hook them up. So I don't know what I'm going to do, I might put the hard drives there. Um, I don't know what else I could put there, really. Uh, here's our CD drive, and here's that tape drive. We've got a lot of, a lot of cables here. A lot of them I tried to move out of the way. Um, there's our RAM. Uh, I might max the RAM in this. I, I know I wanted to kind of keep it how I found it, but I may max. It depends. Um, I'd probably put at least maybe 64 or 32 megabytes in there. Uh, there's our CPU, socket 3. I know this is a DX4-100, uh, but I don't know if it's one of the enhanced one that has right back cache. Uh, if it's not, I might, I might grab a DX4 that does have uh, right back and put it in there. Um, we've got our motherboard, if you can see that. It is a VLI. 46 SV2GX4. Not familiar with this board. Um, uh, revision 1.7. Looks like a SIS chipset. Uh, there's some cache chips. I can see them down there. I, I think there's only 256 uh, KB of L2 cache. I, I might I might increase that too. I Okay, so the first card I pulled out, uh, the upper, the topmost card is a network card. Now, I don't really use networking on these old machines. I'm not really into, um, you know, retro networking or anything. So I'm not really going to go into detail on this card. I don't really know anything about old network cards. 16-bit ISA it has a coaxial connection and some other kind of connection. Uh, SMC, it's got a spot. You can add a, a ROM chip there. Uh, I know that can be useful for certain things. Other than that, I don't really know much about this uh, card. It's, that's a hefty block there. <laughs> I don't, I've seen a lot of network cards because um, I pull them from a lot of machines, but I've never. I don't think I've seen like a block like that. Like it's quite a big block on there. So network card. Let's move on to the next one. Next card is a little I.O. card. Um, now I am dusting these as I take them off, so if it looks clean and you're like, ah, oh, you must have, you've been through here and clean it. I'm, I'm cleaning them off as I take them all out uh, right before I take some video of this. So yeah, this was really dusty. They all are. Um, yes, yeah, so this is uh, StarTech, just, a, just an I.O. controller. Uh, I don't, nothing really <laughs> super uh, interesting. So, let's move on. Okay. Now, this next card is extremely interesting to me because I do not have any examples of this kind of card in my collection. And um, this is a VLB uh, 
controller card, but it has cache on it. So this is for controlling your uh, like IDE controller and floppy drives, but it has cache on it, uh, which theoretically should make the accessing uh, much faster, or you don't have to use programs like, say, Smart Drive, which eat up your uh, conventional memory. So I I've done some research on these uh, kind of boards, and apparently later hard drives... Uh, it doesn't really do much, if anything. It might even make them slower, but like hard drives from around this period, ha having cache on board should speed up uh, accessing those drives uh, noticeably. And I think this has 512 uh, kilobytes of uh, cache, and I think you can upgrade it to 1 megabyte, but I'm not sure. Uh, we have two IDE connectors. That's pretty standard, so four IDE devices. And it's interesting, it looks like two, four, two floppy drive um, connectors there. So I don't know if that's meant for like two separate ones or if it's standard where that's like four floppy devices. Um, so that's interesting. This is, the, uh, this is from Promise. This is the DC4030VL2. And like I said, I've never owned, I've owned uh, VLB uh, controllers, I.O. controllers, and I've run, you know, hard drives and SCSI devices off the VLB, but I've never had one with onboard cash, but I've always wanted them. They're kind of kind of rare and expensive, so when I found this in this machine, I was really excited. Um, now, this also came with boxes, a couple boxes, and uh, the interesting thing about this one is, um, so here's the box that came with it, and, uh, you know, and I have what looks like some discs, so it looks like maybe drivers or something, disk accelerator, device driver, uh, Promise Technologies. Um, but uh, apparently at some point the previous owner upgraded the, the chips on it. Um, and I think from looking at this paper here, now I, I think this, these chips are upgrades to allow for LBA, uh, which allows you to use larger hard drive. So LBA, logical block address, one of the features of enhanced IDE. Um, this allows you to access IDE drives with a capacity greater than 528 megabytes. Uh, so that's that's really cool because from what I was trying to find on the web that uh, these chips or this card with the, like the upgraded chips is pretty uncommon. Uh, so that's another great thing. I'm not I'm not sure what the total capacity is now with these chips. Maybe two gigs, maybe four gigs. I don't know. Um, but that would be pretty cool if I can, you know, put in a four gigabyte uh, hard drive if it's hooked up to this thing, and it lets me kind of break that 528 uh, megabyte barrier using this controller. Plus, you know, the cache. I'm going to try to use something somewhat period so I can take advantage of this. Uh, after this project, though, I, I might remove this card and try it in a different machine, because I have, I have a machine where this might come in very handy, and that, that's going to be a whole other video. So this, this might not stay in this machine, but we'll see. So let's move on to the next card. And now we're moving on to the video, which is, a, is another exciting, cool find. Um, so this is a higher-end VLB video card that was installed in this machine. Uh, it uses the S3 Vision uh, 964 chipset, so very compatible, uh, pretty fast. Uh, we got a date of 1994. Uh, I don't know how much RAM is on this, but I have the box, and the box has written on it 2 megabytes. Um, so... Uh, I haven't been able to test it yet, so that would be really cool if it's two megabytes and then you can upgrade it to four. Because uh, from my knowledge, there's very few uh, VLB cards that you can go up to four megabytes. I don't know how useful that would be in games and stuff, um, but it's just cool to have that. So yeah, this is this is one of the later VLB cards, uh, probably one of the better ones, probably one of the faster ones. If it's S3, it's really you know compatible with a lot of games. I'm guessing. Um, I got the box with it too, and um, this is the Diamond uh, Stealth 64. Uh, so, and on the side, if you look, it has written um, Stealth 64 VLV RAM, 2 megabytes VRAM, 
uh, newest BIOS and drivers and then it says like new 150 so I'm guessing there's two megabytes on it and it can be expanded to four which I would like to do uh, if I could so the, yeah the BIOS if you look here it's version 1.06U and in this little box uh, it looks like there was an older one that was version 1.04H so the previous owner uh, upgraded the BIOS on this too uh, which is really cool now I don't know if this is the newest one now because who knows when he did that maybe it was back in the mid um, mid 90s but it, it's still it's still neat and then in here there was uh, I found something for TurboCAD and uh, in control tools so maybe this machine was used for CAD so that would make sense why it was a little it's kind of high end and then we just have uh, I don't know if these are drivers it's the stealth yeah stealth 64 drivers I'm probably gonna put Windows 3.1 on this as well as DOS so don't know if these discs work but it's it's cool to have them there are a lot of goodies when I pick this thing up so uh, let's move on Okay, so the next card here is what I'm guessing is the controller for the uh, 120 megabyte tape drive uh, just because it says jumperless tape controller it looks like it requires Molex power um, we just got some chips and it looks like an IDE uh, there's something I don't know if that it's supposed to be like that or that pin broke off um, I don't know but it, this I thought this was the SCSI uh, at a glance from the outside but yeah this is our tape controller and it looks like it's 8-bit now depending on if I can get this working or not I don't know if I'm gonna leave it in there I would like to but if I can't get the tape drive working I mean what's the point although I don't even have any tapes to test it so we'll see alright and then lastly let's move on to the sound card and lastly we have the sound card now you would think uh, with my suspicions this was being a CAD machine that there wouldn't be a sound card or it'd be something really generic there's it's, someone actually put some effort into this the sound on this thing in the back in the day so I don't know maybe the guy used it to game at home and do CAD but um, yeah this is an early Sound Blaster 16 uh, a CT 1770 uh, this is the SCSI version so it has a SCSI connector and a SCSI controller on it and um, you might also notice right away it has a wave blaster on it um, now I believe this is uh, creatives official wave blaster now I heard these kinda are crappy for MIDI but I've never seen one before I've never owned one um, so it's just neat to have uh, that it's really cool that there's actually a wave blaster on there and another thing if you'll notice uh, it has the ASP chip in there too so I can use this to play like the one or two games that actually support that I don't I don't think I have any uh, of the older Sound Blaster 16s that have the ASP chip so I mean it's nothing like super exotic it's just a, an early Sound Blaster 16 but it might be as exotic of a Sound Blaster 16 as I could find it's an older one it probably doesn't have the hanging MIDI note bug but I don't know for sure yet because I haven't uh, checked um, it has it has the SCSI it has the uh, wave blaster for MIDI and it has the ASP chip so uh, again it's just an early Sound Blaster 16 but it's it's as exotic as you can get for an early Sound Blaster 16 and it it's just cool because I don't have I don't even think I have a a Sound Blaster 16 that's the the SCSI version so it, that's just cool and here's the card with the wavetable header separated I decided to brave it and take off the wavetable header um, yeah, I mean, these aren't particularly liked uh, for their sound quality and uh, MIDI, but uh, it's it's still kind of cool to find one. I've never seen one in all my years of uh, finding Sound Blaster 16s. I've never found one that actually has the Wave Blaster connected to it. Uh, looks like some Motorola chips on there. So, and uh, here's that card without the uh, Wave Blaster on it. And there is our uh, ASP chip right there. At least uh, that's what I believe that is so I, I again I was really excited with this machine um, we can look at it again here with all the cards removed I mean it's, it doesn't look like a, a super interesting motherboard but it does look a little bit like later and a bit high-end I wonder how much L2 cache it supports um, I don't know just just cool this was just a cool find um, I found other things too along with this but that's that's another that's another video so um
Well, we can look at the power supply here. Uh, what is it? Fortron source. Um, what's it? It's, it's only 250, which is, that should be fine for this the time period. So, yeah, that's it. I guess the next step is to put a hard drive in and put the cards in and just see how far we can uh, just start restoring this thing. So, uh, but first, I at least want to just get it booting DOS so we can check things and. And see things. I'm gonna I'm gonna remove this and I'm gonna check the exact CPU here. Neat thing about this case that I really like is this area right here. I don't have any drives in there, but you could put uh, drives in there. Probably hard drives. Uh, it's meant for. But there's three screws here, and um, see my jumpers. I can't really get to them because they're under this thing. But if you take out these screws, this whole thing's on a hinge. So ah, I can get to the jumpers now. Um, that's a really cool feature of this case, and it has the little rail guides for the if you got any extra long cards. So the CPU has been removed just to take a look at it itself. I've actually considered putting a Pentium overdrive in here because it'd be it'd be kind of cool, and it, you know it'd be 83 megahertz, and it'd be I don't I don't think I'm gonna do that. Um, if I do, I'd have to change the name of this video. Um, maybe I will eventually. I don't know. Uh, interesting thing though about this DX4. Um, there was no thermal paste, didn't really need it uh, at the time, I believe. It, it does have a heat sink and fan here. Um, this has a really good close, it hold, held it pretty tight in there. And I pushed out the CPU and um, there's nothing on it. It's completely, I mean, I don't, it should say like, you know, Intel DX4. So there's no markings on this thing. There are none, none whatsoever. So here is our actual Intel uh, DX4, and I have it next to its AMD equivalent. Um, I've seen Intel DX4s before, and usually they're kind of like the AMD chip. It has, you know, something on there. It will say, you know, Intel DX4 100. Um, it's usually something. I don't know. Maybe it was, it got worn off over the years. I don't know, but it does seem to function just fine. So looking at this board here, the Silk Street, it does look like um, it does look like this board can take up to one megabyte of L2 cache. Now, I don't know if I'm going to do that because I don't know if there'd be much point. It might even hurt performance. Um, but I might take it up to 512 just because. Um, I don't know. I got to look at that. If I have 64 megabytes of um, of RAM to cache all of that I think I would need 512 but I don't I'm not good with the math so I'll have to double check that and I think right now it has 256 so mm, I don't know we'll see I got that CPU back in so um, now I'll just put in all the cards and we'll cross our fingers and hope it still posts so I got a I got an option to F1 to continue or go to setup and I got the hard disk failure obviously there's no hard disk but usually at this point it will go and it will say like you know your CPU and all your basic information and it will say like no boot device or whatever but it just the energy star logo disappeared then it just hangs here so uh, huh oh well I mean I guess the next step is trying to see if we can get a hard drive working on this thing so obviously this wasn't set up it's at 8 and then when you hit the turbo button and it works and then it says 33 so um, it all works, it's just, I've got to figure out how to change it on there. Uh, let's try the reset, yep. Reset works, so that's good. Um, let me try... Ah, yes, a caddy. So yeah, this is a definitely a caddy drive. Um, how does that work? It's hard to do it without, with uh, one hand. Okay, yeah. There's no CD in there though, but and uh, this is SCSI actually. This is hooked up to the sound card, so okay. Well, let's see if I can run the setup. Um, hit delete, and yeah, at least we can get into the BIOS. So good start. This is a good start. So I'll just build on it from here. Okay. Okay, there it is. Just took a little bit longer to show up than usual. Uh, CPU DX4S, 100 megahertz, uh, our base memory, the 32 megabytes. We do have 256 of L2 cache. 
looks like it might be seeing those ports from the I.O. card. Got our floppy drive, and then we have it's a lot of hard disk. Usually there's only like one or two, but we act, it actually has four um, that it lists there. I don't know, maybe that's because of the, uh, the caching controller. Um, okay, so we got to add a hard drive. Start from there and then build on it. So I hooked up a hard drive, ID hard drive, from around the period um, to the caching controller. And uh, now it does this, it does detect it. Uh, it gives me the firmware and BIOS revision. Um, it looks like it has two megabytes of memory on board. Then it kind of locks up here. So I'm um, just going to have to do some trial and error things, figure out what's going on here. Uh, another change I might make. I might uh, try to max out the RAM on the cache controller just because um, I don't know what that is. I'm thinking maybe four megabytes. Uh, so I'll have to look and see if I can add some more memory to that. Just I don't know, just because I can. Okay, so I've been working on this machine a little bit more lately, and you may notice some differences. Um, so and I made some progress with this. Uh, first off, I did get the CD-ROM drive running. Uh, I'm running off that SCSI controller on the Sound Blaster 16. I just loaded the Adaptech drivers for it. it. Worked right away. I've tested it. It works fine. Um, the other thing you might notice is I did replace that uh, Colorado tape drive. Um, it, it just was useless to me. Uh, I just didn't... You know, I could have found the drivers for it and set it up, but... I don't have any of the tapes for it anyways. Um, you, you know, I didn't really want to spend the money buying one. I don't think they'd be a tape for that would be expensive, but I would just never use it. Uh, with a zip drive, it kind of serves the same purpose, and I use zip drives all the time with my retro systems. It does not look quite as nice as when I had that Colorado tape drive in there, but it's far more useful. Sort of. Um, I can't get it to work. Uh, I cannot get it to work with that uh, caching IDE controller. Uh, I've tried all kind of setups and slave, master, different cables. Um, I tried it on the IDE 1, IDE 2. It just, it just doesn't work. I don't know if it's just a quirk or that maybe that card only supports hard drives. Um, I don't know. Now speaking of that card, I did upgrade it to four megabytes of uh, onboard cache and uh, it is seeing a hard. I put a, a hard drive in there, and I've got um, I've got MS DOS six point two two on there, and uh, yeah, it, I didn't have to use like a drive overlay or anything. It's just seeing the whole drive. I think it's like a, I think it's a two gigabyte drive, um, and it's seeing the whole thing just fine. Uh, so it is booting up to the OS and everything. Uh, like I said, the only two problems I have right now is this is not being seen. And that controller is also a little bit finicky with the mouse for some reason. So here's an interesting tidbit about this setup, uh, specifically that I.O. card. Um, now originally I was going with this. This is like my standard serial mouse I just have sitting there. I use it for all my setups that use a serial mouse as a temporary mouse. Um, and it's always worked just fine. But on this setup, it just wasn't working. If you really tried you could get the cursor to like move real little bit but it was it was very erratic um, and I thought maybe there's just something wrong with the IO controller but um, just to check things out I tried this older kind of style serial mouse um, this generic mouse um, pretty much it's the same it's a serial mouse and um, it worked perfect uh, on that machine and I did I went back and I checked this on a different machine, and this mouse works just fine. So I don't know what it is about the mice or that I.O. controller, but it seems to favor this serial mouse over this serial mouse, so I don't know. But anyways, uh, I think we're about ready to try some games on this thing. The only other thing I have to do now is kind of take this faceplate off and uh, see if I can set this megahertz. Well, I know it's not as cool as actually having the megahertz number on there, but I had to change, decide to change the LED to a generic high when it's in its faster speed mode, and low when it's in its lower speed mode. Um, it's just it's generic, but it's very versatile. So now I can put any CPU in there, and I don't have to worry about changing the speeds. And I can use you know something over 100 megahertz 
and uh, it not you know feel weird because this is only two digits so you know if I put in like a some kind of like a AMD 5x 86 at 133 megahertz I can't put that in there um, so now it's just you know high so I think that works So here we are with the uh, post sequence. I always like showing the post and boot up with these uh, when I do a new machine. Um, everything's pretty much working now uh, with the exception of that zip drive. I think it's just the I.O. control. It's not a big deal. I didn't really need to use it anyways. And I have I have plans for this machine uh, after this video is done. So we're just going to go through this uh, boot up sequence and then we're going to look at some games and uh, wrap things up. Uh, here is the that caching I.O. controller. I did upgrade it to 4 megabytes, as I said earlier. Um, I also didn't mention about this CPU. This is a, it's not a very good overclocker. I have read that some people have overclocked it to like 120-ish megahertz. Um, it, maybe 133, I, I don't recall, but I do know it's, it's kind of difficult to overclock these. Um, they just don't make good overclockers, and um, I don't think you, you don't really get a ton of benefit from an A's. If you, if you want to go faster than 100 megahertz, just go go the easy route, just get an AMD uh, 5x86. You can overclock those to 160 megahertz, easy. Uh, so here we go, loading up the uh, sound card and uh, that SCSI controller on it, which worked just fine. I just put in the standard adapt tech and it detected that uh, caddy drive right away. Uh, I'm not using cute mouse drivers this time though, you know, something a little different. They, they have a bigger footprint, but I just wanted to mess around with different drivers. You can also see here we're detecting two gigabytes of that hard drive. And uh, just to go back for a minute, if you want to see what happens when you do hit F2 for that caching I/O controller, uh, this is the menu that comes up, and you can set you know cache mode and handler. And I didn't really mess with this stuff too much because I don't know what I'm doing with these. Um, but uh, there's a bus speed thing if you're running less than 50 megahertz. We are in this instance, and um, just things like that. Let's move on to some benchmarks really quick and then let's look at some games.
So one quirk I did come across, uh, for whatever reason, uh, when I tried to play Dark Forces, the digital sound effects worked fine, but I could not get music to work if I tried to use the uh, Wave Blaster. I set it up for General MIDI, and I uh, even tried setting it up as under Roland, and in the sound test, it worked. But in the actual game, it didn't work um, for whatever reason. So in the end, I just had to go with the uh, FM. So the, for the last game in our lineup, looking at working on this system, I wanted to take another look at our sound card uh, really quickly. Because if you remember earlier, uh, I always said this one had that ASP chip, which I believe stands for Advanced Signal Processing Chip. Uh, I don't want to take the wavetable header off, but you can see it in there, right there. Um, so here's an example of a similar card that doesn't have the chip. Um, so it would go right here. And the overwhelming majority of these older Sound Blaster 16s that I find are missing that ASP chip. Um, it, it's even hard to find out what it does exactly. Not much. Apparently Creative had a really like steep licensing fee if you wanted to use the ASP chip and it was just virtually never used. Uh, the, I could only find one game that supposedly takes advantage of the ASP chip and I actually have that game, and that is the original TFX, so Tactical Fighter Experiment. You'd think it would be experimental, but um, this game supposedly is the only game out there. I don't even know if it's the only application out there. Maybe there's some sort of sound uh, studio program that uses that chip. I don't know, but as far as games go, this is the only one I could find any information that supposedly uses that ASP chip. Now, there's nothing on this box that says anything about it, it uh, or the manual. Now, it does say in requirements Sound Blaster 16. It supports Sound Blaster 16, but I can find no reference to the ASP chip. Um, I went through the install and setup program. No reference to the ASP chip. Uh, some searching online uh, seems to comment that the only thing that the ASP chip actually adds is uh, surround sound. So if you play this game, with a card with the ASP chip, you can activate surround sound, I suppose. Now, I don't have a setup for that right now for the PC, so uh, I'm not really going to test that. But we'll just see how this thing uh, sounds on, the, uh, on this card. Come on. 
And um, there it is. There is my DX4 tower. Uh, not a bad find for a uh, swap meet find for a couple bucks. Uh, pleasantly surprised with the cards inside. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, I didn't find a VLB 3D blaster. It wasn't like finding like a Macintosh Lisa for five bucks or something, but uh, pretty cool, interesting cards in there. Uh, it's so cool. I think I'm going to keep this guy. I'll, I'll find some place to put it. Uh, I am not going to keep it in the configuration it is now. I'm, I'm really going over what I want to do with it. Uh, I might put an AMD 5x86 setup in there. How exactly I'm going to set that up, I'm, I don't quite know yet, but I definitely want to keep this case around. I'm going to swap out some of those cards in there. Uh, maybe keep the motherboard, maybe put something else in there depending on what I decide to do with it. Um, I'm not sure yet. Maybe even a Pentium Pro build? This case might be cool for a Pentium Pro. Um, I mean, the only downside is, like I said, the LED, but we got that high-low thing. So, uh, yeah, pretty cool. Uh, so, if you like this kind of content, uh, please subscribe, hit the like button, click that bell thing, apparently, you have to do now, and, um... Feel free to comment in the comments. I love your comments. Uh, I try to respond to them. Even if I don't respond to your comment, I always read all of my comments. Um, so comment if you'd like. Uh, any ideas for this thing. But uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see, hopefully see you in the next video.